to come speak at the meeting. Um, so this is joint work with my former PhD student, Constantino Cianos, and I am going to tell you about consensus-based distributed online prediction and stochastic optimization. Uh, an alternate title could be Achieving uh, Order Square Root of M Regret with Approximate Distributed Mini Badges. Okay, so um, let me start out by telling you what, what is the stochastic online prediction problem so that we're all on the same page. So we're going to be doing prediction in an online manner. So that means we're going to make some prediction, W say at time one, and then we're going to receive some observation or some, some random sample from the world, and we're going to suffer some loss, uh, which is a function of both the prediction that we made and the observation that we make. And at that point, we can refine our prediction, maybe incorporate some information that we gained. Um, we'll make a new observation and suffer a new loss. And this is going to repeat on and on and on. And the, the way we're going to measure performance is in terms of a regret, a standard way to do this. Um, we're going to operate under the assumption that these observations that we're making are all drawn IID from some unknown distribution. And so, um, so that's going to be one of the underlying assumptions, and I'll tell you more in a moment. And the way that we're going to measure performance that we, uh, the way, well, yeah, how we're performing is in terms of this regret. So this says, after we've made M predictions and M observations, how well are we doing? How, what is the uh, loss or the regret that we've accumulated relative to what we would have accumulated if we were using a predictor which minimizes the expected value of this loss function with respect to that unknown distribution? So we don't know W star, and we want to try to find something which is close to W star. And so the goal is to quickly find something close to W star without accumulating too much regret. Okay. Um, and so there's a nice survey on this by Shaisha Love Schwartz, and many others have done work on this area, I'm not citing all by any means, but uh, it's a nice survey if, if you're not familiar with the problem. So the assumptions that I'll be making about the loss function for this talk are that it's convex in, uh, in the prediction parameter W, so for any x, uh, f is going to be convex. Uh, it's Lipschitz continuous, and it has Lipschitz continuous gradients. And the other thing I'm going to assume is, so we have IID observations. X is our IID, and so um, that basically gives us that our, the gradients that we would take by evaluating at these random observations are unbiased. And we're also going to assume that they have a bounded variance, sigma squared. These are standard assumptions in this literature. All right, and so I'm just repeating the definition of regret there to remind us what it is. And so we also know from the optimization literature and refinements of it that the best one could hope to do in this scenario is to have a regret which grows like the square root of m under the assumptions that I've made. If you make stronger assumptions, you can get better bounds, but the best we can hope for under this set of assumptions for this class of functions is to have regret which grows like the square root of m. And it's achieved by many algorithms, uh, many first order algorithms just using gradient based information. Um, in particular, it's achieved by Nesterov's dual averaging algorithm, and that's something that we'll build on later on in this talk. Okay. So now what is distributed online prediction? So the previous framework I told you was in more of a sequential setting or a, a serial setting, one processor receiving observations, making predictions. But if you're operating in a setting where the rate at which you need to make predictions, the rate at which your observations are arriving, is faster than a serial processor can handle, that motivates going to a, a parallel or a distributed setting. So now the problem formulation is going to be that we have some network of processors. Each one is receiving its own stream of observations, x sub i at node i, and it also has to make predictions, and it's going to suffer loss correspondingly for each of those observations that it makes. And so these processors are going to be connected in some form of a network, which we'll describe by a graph. Uh, that could be given to us. It could be something that we'll want to design, but we'll assume that it's connected, uh, symmetric, and, and this is how we communicate between different nodes, by passing messages over this graph. All right, and so now, in this setting, the way we'll measure performance or regret is by saying we need to accumulate the regret that is, is incurred by all nodes in the network. So we're going to have to sum over all nodes, i. And if the network has collectively processed m observations, made m predictions, uh, we're going to divide those m observations uniformly over all nodes. And so each node uh, has this m over n predictions that it's made. And our regret otherwise looks very similar. All right, so again, we would like to know how, how can we do in this distributed setting now. And so um, clearly one could be uh, naive and try to completely avoid communication. And in, 
uh, that would be ideal in the sense we would save a lot of energy. Sorry, it didn't come out the right way. <laughs> That's not what I was trying to say. Um, but we, we could not collaborate at all. Okay? And so if we don't collaborate at all, then what would we end up having? Well, our regret would scale like n times the regret of a serial processor. Right? And a serial processor that only saw one nth of the samples. And so uh, that regret would scale like square root of n times n. So as we have more processors, even though we've seen the total same amount of data, uh, the regret is going to grow. So we need some collaboration, but we do want to keep it to a minimum. So with collaboration, we know the best we can hope to do is as if we had one super processor that was streaming n times faster than any individual processor, in which case we would get this regret, regret round again of grow, uh, the regret growing like the square root of m, okay? which is the best we can hope to take. So, so the question is really, can we do this? And what is the minimal amount of communication that we need in order to accomplish this? OK. And so how do we achieve this? It can be achieved. Um, and so one approach to doing this was proposed by Offer Deckel and his colleagues at Microsoft. And uh, what they observed was in the serial setting now, what we could do is rather than processing and updating our predictor after every single observation, let's group together a batch, what they call a mini batch of observations. And let's say that that batch is of size B. And so what we're going to do is use the same predictor. Uh, so WB is still equal to W1 for those first B observations that we make. And we're going to do that so that we can aggregate our gradients. So we're going to uh, take the gradients at the same predictor, but for all of our different, our first batch of B observations. And so since these gradients are random, averaging, averaging them is going to reduce the variance. And so that's going to give us a more confident direction in which we, we can update our predictor. But at the same time, we've accumulated this loss over all of that mini batch of, of B predictors. And so it turns out in this setting, if you choose, well, if for, for an arbitrary B, you can show that the regret is going to scale like O of B plus the square root of M plus B. I'm leaving out the constants for the talk today. Um, and so clearly choosing B appropriately to be less than square root of M or at most order square root of M is going to give you the same scaling in terms of your regret. Okay, so this isn't interesting necessarily in the serial setting, but the reason it's interesting if you're not going to move into the parallel setting is that you can do this batching in parallel. I can say I'm going to give 1 over n of my batch to each one of my processors and do that in parallel to get some sort of a speed up. But if we do that, then we need to do some communication in order to compute this average gradient. Okay? And so in the distributed mini-batch algorithm that Deckel et al. propose, this is what they do. And they say we're going to distribute the mini-batch of B samples across our n nodes. We're going to aggregate synchronously along a spanning tree using something like an all-reduce operation. So we're going to compute the average and also at the same time distribute that average back to every other node in the network. Okay, so every node in this case is exactly going to receive the average. And the one thing to, to be careful of here is now while we're communicating, so remember we were motivated to go to the parallel setting because the stream of, of predictions that we have to make was arriving too fast for one processor to handle. And so while we're doing our communication, we still have to account for the fact that additional, uh, additional predictions are going to have to be made. And so we're still going to be using our old predictor before we get to do this update. So there's some latency in this communication. And the way that we can quantify that is to say that during the time that we're communicating, uh, an additional mu samples arrive to the network and need to be processed. Okay? And so in this case, the regret, the definition of the regret is essentially the same, but it looks as follows. It says that um, we've still processed with a network of n nodes, a total of m samples. We've divided those into a number of rounds, which is equal to the total number of samples, divided by the number of samples that arrive to the network in one round. And that's the number b that we use to compute one mini batch gradient, plus the additional number mu that arrive to the network while we're aggregating this gradient using something like an all-reduce. Okay. And so this is divided up over n nodes. And so that number of total samples per one round of the mini-batch algorithm is also divided uniformly amongst the end nodes, we'll say. Okay, that's what's going on here. And otherwise, we're the same as we were before. Okay. And so if we do this, um, what they show is that we can achieve the optimal regret still in this setting by choosing the appropriate, uh, appropriate choice of this parameter b, the size of our mini-batch. So really what it tells you is that your communication latency in the end, doesn't hurt you, at least in terms of the order-wise rate at which your regret grows. Okay. 
So this is, this is interesting now because we're doing this in parallel and so we're going to get the, the speed ups, the benefits that we would hope to get by uh, using parallel computing. Uh, this is looking at, uh, yeah, mu staying constant, essentially, as m goes to infinity, right? So, so and that's reasonable, right? Um, so the question was, uh, how does this depend on, on mu? Sorry, yes. So, and the, so the dependence on mu really is to say that the, the latency, um, the amount of time it takes us to aggregate one mini-batch, shouldn't depend on how many total samples we've seen over time. Right? So this is asymptotic as m goes to infinity. So it's going to stay constant. <coughs> I agree with you 100% too that it's going to depend on n, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Yeah, so that's really the cost of the communication here. Um, but we'll just leave it as a, 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 a latency mu. Uh, it, I mean, in short, you would expect that if you have n nodes, and if you have a nice balanced tree, the depth of that tree is log n, and so the latency should be on the order of log n, right? So mu is on the order of log n, but in the asymptotics as m goes to infinity, that doesn't hurt us. Yeah, okay. Um, so the questions I wanted to think about for this talk are, do we need to exactly compute the average? Okay, so in this model that we've discussed so far, we do our mini batching and then we synchronously compute the, the average over time. And one would like to go about doing this maybe in a more asynchronous manner, kind of randomly interleaving uh, gradient updates with samples arriving to the network. All right, and so the motivation for this talk is to move towards a fully asynchronous method for doing this. Okay, um, and so let's let's be precise about what we want to do when we're saying we want to accomplish an approximate uh, distributed averaging in order to do this. So, just to make it concrete, our all reduce operation we can think of as being an exact distributed averaging protocol in the following sense: If I call all reduce and node i gives some input y i divided by n, I'm thinking my all reduce with the sum operator here. Then we're going to add those up, and every node is going to get the sum. Right? And so the sum of these yi's over n is just exactly the average. And so we've computed the average exactly at every node. So in an approximate distributed averaging protocol, I'll say that I have an approximate distributed averaging protocol which gives me a delta accurate average with, uh, with latency mu if the output of this, when I give it some value yi at node i initially, is such that for every node i, if I compare that output yi at node i to the average of the initial values that they gave to this all reduce, uh, this distributed averaging protocol, they're all within delta of the average. Right? And so this is a Euclidean norm. And uh, still with some latency mu, which is going to be similar to the, well, it's going to depend on the algorithm, of course, that we use, but it'll be in the same sense, measured in the same units as the latency in the previous slide. Okay. And so the reason that uh, I'm interested in, in going this route is an alternative to using an all-reduce for computing and distributed averaging is to use something like a gossip algorithm. And so briefly introduce gossip algorithms. I'll introduce a synchronous version, and then I'll tell you afterwards that um, there are ways to make this completely asynchronous. Uh, I won't go into it in the talk today, though. I can tell you about that offline. So uh, here's the simple version of a gossip algorithm. It's really a linear iteration. We're going to assume that we have some doubly stochastic matrix W. And that matrix W respects the, the topology of our network. Okay? So in the sense that an entry Wij is larger than 0 if and only if we have an edge between nodes i and j in our graph, if they communicate. And then we're going to repeat linear iterations uh, of the form I've written up here. So y, y could be a vector still. But what we're going to do is after the k plus first, uh, on the k plus first iteration at node i, it's going to take some weight from its previous iterate. And it's also going to add in some amount that it receives from the other nodes, j in the network. Now, because wij uh, respects the topology of the graph, the only non-zero terms in this sum are those corresponding to neighbors of node i. And so essentially what this corresponds to is node i sending its current iterate to its neighbors, receiving its current iterate from its neighbors, and then they can all update this linear sum together. Okay, so this would be a synchronous description of the algorithm. Each round, each of the k iterations of that gossip algorithm would require communicating uh, one copy of the vector to each of its neighbors. And of course, this could be done in an asynchronous manner too. Um, and then if you put sort of a probabilistic model on how you achieve asynchrony, you get probabilistic results. But in this deterministic setting, we can say the following. 
we can say that as that number of iterations k tends to infinity, uh, clearly the value at every node is going to tend to the average. And this is one way to see this is that W can be thought of as uh, the probability transition matrix of a Markov chain, which has uniform stationary distribution. And so taking powers of, of that matrix is just going to have every node converge to uniform. And so that gives us the average. And if we only do a finite number of iterations, we're not going to get exactly to the average, but we can bound the error at any node. And we can say that every node is going to be within delta of the average if the number of iterations that we take looks like log of 1 over delta, the accuracy that we want to get to, times the square root of n, that's the size of the network, times the worst case uh, distance that any node starts out from the average. And this is also divided by 1 minus the second largest eigenvalue of this matrix, this weight matrix W that we're talking about. So this is the spectral gap. Uh, if you're familiar with the rates at which Markov chains converge to their stationary distribution, this comes up there too. This essentially encodes something to do with the structure of the graph that we're, we're doing this gossip algorithm over. The, the, it's related to a diffusion over this graph as well. And so if we have something like a ring, it's going to take a long time for information to diffuse from one end to the other. And so the spectral gap is going to be on the order of n. It's going to be the size of the network. And so for something intermediate, like a random geometric graph or a 2D grid, we get things which look like square root of n or square root of n over log n. And on the other hand, if we have a, a, a nice graph, either a complete graph or an expander graph, uh, then this inverse spectral gap or relaxation time is, is going to be of the order of constant, regardless of the size of our network. So that's maybe the most interesting case. If you can design your network, then design it to be something like this, because then your rates don't depend on the structure of the network. All right, and so why might these gossip algorithms be interesting in the context of, of this workshop for distributed um, optimization and machine learning? Well, it's not necessarily clear that you would want to do this in a data center, let's say, where you can do averaging reliably using something like an all reduce. But if you're doing distributed learning, uh, say more in the sense of the talk that Nina gave the other night, where your, your machines are really distributed geographically across a large region, and so communication is unreliable, then we can talk more, but I think this type of an algorithm might be interesting. It doesn't require you to uh, update and maintain a spanning tree over your network and can be done in a nice asynchronous manner. Okay, and of course, uh, there's been quite a bit of work in this area looking at using gossip and related types of algorithms for doing distributed optimization. This traces back to the, the seminal work of Tsitsiklas, Bertekis, and Athens in the 80s. And more recently, there's been uh, quite a lot of interest in this area, including work uh, by Angelia Nedich and her colleagues at, at Illinois and Oswes Dogler at MIT, as well as here at Berkeley by Ducci Agarwal and Rainwright. Um, so the, the work of Nedich and, and her colleagues looks more at doing averaging in the primal domain. And uh, the paper of Ducci Agarwal and Wainwright looks at uh, doing the averaging more in the dual domain in the sense of Nesterov's uh, dual averaging algorithm. And that's going to be the, the approach that we'll also adopt in the work I'll tell you about today. So let me tell you about an algorithm now for doing distributed dual averaging with approximate mini batches. Okay, so um, we'll say that each node is going to initialize, so each node is going to have two variables now, since we're doing Nesterov's dual averaging algorithm. So we're going to have a dual variable z at each node and a primal variable w at each node as well. And we'll initialize both of those just to be the zero vectors. Okay. And then we're going to repeat for the number of iterations, which depends on the number of samples that we plan to observe. We will locally compute a mini batch gradient. And this is just scale. Each node has b over n samples that it's going to take in order to have a total mini batch across the network that has size b. We're going to run our approximate distributed averaging algorithm where the argument that we give it is uh, our dual variable plus this new batch gradient. Okay. And then we're going to put it through a, a proximal projection. So uh, h here is a strongly convex prox function. Think of it as the Euclidean norm, if you wish. And uh, this beta t sequence is going to be a sequence of algorithm parameters, which are non-negative and which are strictly increasing. These are just the uh, parameters of the algorithm, the standard dual averaging algorithm, if you're familiar with that. All right, and so again, what we're doing our approximate distributed averaging on here is our previous dual variable at node i plus this mini batch gradient that it just computed. And so if we think about what this should give us, it should give us something like after we've computed 
this, if we've done our distributed averaging and, and delta is small, we should all have something like the average of these values, which is just our average dual variable from the previous iteration, plus our mini batch gradient involving all B of these samples. Right? So this is, if we did this exactly, then it would be identical to the distributed mini batch algorithm of Dekel et al, where we aggregate up and down a spanning tree. But in this case, this is going to have some error, so we're not going to have exactly this. And so analyzing this algorithm involves accounting for that error, making sure that it doesn't get too large, essentially. And just to remind us again, during this mini batch part of the algorithm, across the network we see a total of B samples. And then while we're doing this communication, we're assuming we see some amount of latency mu samples as well. All right, so what can we prove about this algorithm? Um, does it converge? Yes, it converges. What's the rate at which it converges? So one can analyze that algorithm in general for a general distributed averaging algorithm where you have uh, general errors delta and latencies mu and get a result. And then we can plug in things that we know for gossip algorithms. And so in the interest of time, if I combine these two results, what this tells us is that if we run this distributed dual averaging algorithm with approximate mini matches, and at each time that we do gossip, we use the right number of iterations, where that number is k, the right number of gossip iterations. And that depends on the logarithm of 1 plus this constant. So L is our Lipschitz constant of the original function. B is the mini batch size. Mu is the latency. So B plus mu is the total number of samples that we saw throughout that mini batch round, multiplied by the square root of the size of the network and divided by the spectral gap. So it tells us how many iterations of gossip to do at each iteration. Then what we can guarantee, and if we choose our, our algorithm parameters to be as follows, so k, which is the Lipschitz constant of the gradients, plus the square root of t, and now normalized by the total number of samples that we see in that, that round. Then choosing that mini batch size appropriately, similar to the way that you would choose it for the perfect distributed mini batch algorithm, our regret also scales like order of square root of m. Alec. Uh, so I'm a bit confused how the latency can stay fixed with respect of the number of iterations you use for gossip. Because how the mu is being held as a constant and k is essentially being set as a function of mu, so... Uh, the, the two depend on each other. Yes, I agree with you there. So mu is this number of samples. Um, Yes, I do. I, I agree with you. So it's not, it's not clear from the slide. Maybe it's yeah, easier to talk about off, offline. OK. Um, but it'll come up in what I was, uh, was about to say now, which is, so if, if g is an expander, then this number of iterations that we need to run is like log of n. And so mu is going to be like log of n. So if you put log of n in there, you have a log log of n times square root of n. So this is OK. OK. And so I guess what's interesting for me about, about this observation is that the latency here is the same order-wise as aggregating up and down this tree. Right? So it says we're getting um, the same asymptotic regret. Okay, so we're still getting this rate of square root of m. Um, and the amount of communication is the same. Of course, the constants are different. Um, and the reason for choosing this many iterations is this guarantees that the the error after that many iterations is going to be low enough. Right. Okay. So this, there's well-known connections between stochastic online prediction and stochastic optimization. And so um, we can consider a very related problem, which is to say let's minimize the expected value of this loss function where we're receiving random observations of its gradients, essentially, subject to some constraints, for example, w being in script w. And so it's well known that for this problem, if you have regret bounds for stochastic online prediction, those give you directly a bound on your optimality gap. It tells you that uh, the optimality gap after m samples from your random gradient is going to be bounded like 1 over m times the expected regret. Where here, rather than just directly using that dual variable, we're averaging our dual variable uh, over all the samples that we've received. So it's just a, a running average. And so what 
the previous piggybacking on the previous result is it tells us that if we use the same algorithm and the same number of gossip iterations per round, then, well, so now I should take a step back. And I should say that in the online prediction case, our, we were worried about additional samples arriving while we were uh, doing this communication. Now, if we're doing stochastic optimization, in a sense, we don't have to worry about this anymore, right? Because we're, I would picture using this where we have data at each node. We're computing a small mini-batch gradient off of a subset of the data at each node. And so while we're doing this communication, one could conceivably stop doing local computations, hold your value fixed, and then continue after that communication is finished. So we're still back to a, se a sequential algorithm. But um, in this case, essentially, the latency doesn't hurt us here. And so that essentially eliminates the mu from the formula here. And what we get is that our optimality graph is going to go down like 1 over the square root of m. And so uh, m is like b times t, but it's also proportional to n times t, where n is that number of nodes in the network. And so we get that the, the optimality graph is decreasing like the square root of n times t, 1 over the square root of n times t, where n is that number of nodes in the network. t is the number of rounds that we've run the algorithm. And so the accuracy here, in order to guarantee accuracy epsilon, this tells us that the number of rounds of this algorithm we should run is going to grow like 1 over n, 1 over epsilon squared. In other words, this is interesting to me, because if we add more nodes to the network, we actually uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to do this computation. We also reduce the amount of communication per round, since the number of gossip iterations is proportional to the amount of communication, and this is going to go down with n. And this isn't always the case for other consensus-based distributed optimization algorithms. So it's interesting to me that in this scenario, you do get this kind of a speed up where you add more nodes and things go faster. OK. So the only other, uh, I guess there's a related piece of work by Agarwal and Ducci where they do get similar scaling, but it's in a very different setting. They're in more of a master worker architecture, where um, there they have to worry about errors arising, essentially, because these workers could be computing local mini-batch gradients using outdated information. So it's, it's a different setup. It requires some different analysis. But this is, I think, the, the most related result that I've seen in the literature. And so I'm just going to conclude. Um, so I guess the message is that exact averaging is not crucial to get this optimal regret scaling if you have distributed mini-batches. And we just need to ensure that the uh, nodes don't, the values at the nodes don't drift too far apart. So doing enough communication can give you that. Um, the current gossip bounds that I mentioned before, those are worst case in the sense that they assume that when we begin doing this approximate distributed averaging, uh, we have some node who is very far away from the average. Of course, in many practical scenarios, that might not be the case. And so one could imagine trying to do an adaptive type of approach where nodes maybe decide when they've done enough gossiping in order to stop early. And um, now that we've got this in a, a, a sort of this gossip framework with, where we have approximate distributed mini batches, this really is a, a big step towards having asynchronous, completely asynchronous algorithms. I think it's not a stretch to go to a completely asynchronous distributed algorithm of this sort. So the uh, problem that's still unclear to me is that, at least in the serial setting, we know if you have stronger assumptions about your objective, if you know your loss function is strongly convex, then you can attain much faster or much better rates. Your, your regret only grows like log n. And it's not clear to me whether or not that can also be achieved in this distributed setting using approximate mini-batches. But I think um, it seems like it may be, and that's an interesting open problem. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Okay. But you really have to look so at some mirror descent to a accelerated variance so that you can push the uh, pu pu push the terms that are not variance dependent on to one over t squared. Okay. And have one over t with a variance of t squared. Okay. I think John was looking at some of that in his talk. Okay. Is he? Okay. I'll try to talk to him afterwards. Thanks for that comment. <laughs>